Okay, hello and welcome to the Creative Academy. I am Eileen Cook and I'm very excited to have with me today Mary Robinette Kowal, one of, one of my favorite people in general. Uh, she is the author of many fine novels. Uh, currently, I'm suggesting that you check out The Calculating Stars and The Faded Sky, which are her most recent, uh, but I also want to give a big shout out um, to Ghost Talkers, which is one of my favorites as well, so I want to make sure people read that one. Uh, Mary, you may also know from the Writing Excuses podcast. She is one of the uh, hosts of that podcast. Uh, you may also see her at conferences because she's an all-around great speaker uh, and wine drinker. So I can vouch for that. <laughs> well, it, it does help that I have a husband who's a winemaker. You know, it's it's terrible and tragic when he has to bring his work home with him. Let's so try to suffer along. Oh. We try. Oh. That's why I have my tiara. <laughs> I did ask Mary to wear a tiara. She doesn't normally, well, maybe she does normally wear one, but I did <laughs> ask her to wear it because it just, it gives me great joy. And so she's, that's how accommodating she is. That, that's right. Anything for you. Um, you. It is, it is my writing tiara. So it seemed appropriate to wear it to the Writing Academy. And thanks for inviting me. Thank you. So we are very interested in all sorts of things, but one of the things that has come up a few times is talking about short stories. Um, and some people love writing them and reading them. Some people do not. So I'm just curious for you, which did you write first? Did you start with short stories and then go into novels or was it the other way? I mean, it depends on how you define start because, <laughs> because the stuff that I was writing in elementary and high school was mostly short fiction, but I finished very little of it or thought that I did, but really I just stopped. Um, so when I started writing seriously, uh, I started actually with novel uh, and had finished the novel and the, the received wisdom of the, the time was that in order to break in as a novelist, you needed to have short fiction to give you credit. So I switched over to writing short fiction. Now it turns out that that is not true at all. Um, uh, Jim C. Hines did a survey of first novel uh, first novel writers or debut novelists and finding out if they started with uh, short fiction sales or novel sales first. And it was 50-50. So, you know, you, you write what you love. Um, that said, I had loved reading short fiction. And when I, my first sales were short fiction. And I concentrated on that for quite a while before I finally made a novel sale. Um, but I, I continued to write novels alongside the short fiction um, as I was going. Uh, and I, I find, like I enjoy reading both of them and I enjoy writing both of them. So um, so it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. They both came first. That seems fair. Well, and I have to laugh because apparently we were twins in a separate life. We have the same hair. Well, yours is better because it's longer, but... <laughs> um, in terms of very much the same, started writing short stories because that was really all I could sort of do when I was in elementary and junior high. But when I started writing seriously, um, I wrote a novel. Yeah, um, yeah. There, there's a, a funny perception nowadays that uh, that if you want to be a serious writer, you have to be a novel writer, which is interesting because historically it was exactly the opposite. Yeah. Historically, uh, actually historically, uh, before that, if you wanted to be a serious writer, you had to write poetry. And, and then, you know, novels were, were vanity projects. And that, that was also true with short fiction for a really long time. The short fiction was where you went if you were serious and then the, the novels were your, your vanity thing. They never made any money back in the day. Yeah, well, they, they often still don't. Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> That is true. a challenge for many of us. Um, but I also think it's interesting in that for me, almost the same thing I thought, well, I have to write short stories because that's what I have to do. So I will do that. And I attempted to do that um, and I really struggled. It turns out I have a hard time with short. Mm. Um, so that's interesting. So I'm curious for you, what do you like about writing short stories versus novels or is there something you like best about each? So for me, they, they kind of do two different things. Um, so with short fiction, the thing that I'm enjoying um, the thing that I like is that I can hold most of the story in my head. Um, you know, it's a project that I can finish relatively quickly. So th there's that, that little aspect of it. But the other thing about short fiction for me is that it is designed to deliver a specific emotional punch. 
And novels are really more about immersion and um, they are, because they're a longer form, you experience a lot of different emotions over the course of them. And it's not to say that short stories are single note, um, much like my lighting today, apparently. <laughs> We have thunderstorms rolling in. I probably should have turned the overhead song before we started. You're just going to get mood lighting. Um, but it's so it's not to say that short fiction is single note, uh, and and bad short fiction usually is single note. It's that it is more focused. Uh, it's a more focused effort in what you're delivering to the reader. I tend to think about fiction in general as ways of hacking the reader's brain. You know, we are we are attempting to adjust a reader's emotional state. And so with short fiction, I have a very targeted goal with that. And with long fiction, um, I, I have, like those targeted goals are just in this scene or this chapter, but there is a, there's a larger uh, shift that I'm trying to make in the reader. So, so for me, that's, that's one of the differences and, and one of the things that I enjoy. Um, I also enjoy the fact that, um, in novels, uh, you know, I can I can noodle a little more in a novel. Uh, in short fiction, I everything- I love that you just used the word noodle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's sometimes I'm like, well, I'm, the, the, the days that are not good, I'm like, I'm writing noodly jazz and I hate noodly <laughs> jazz. Um, but, uh, but it is, it, it, there's a little more flexibility in novels, but in short fiction, every word has to count. And so, and I like that sometimes when I'm going into writing, it's like, no, no, I, I really want to, to be focused and muscular with my writing and, uh, and you know, no extraneous fluff. Um, so it, it's like, they both feed different things for me. Um, the other thing that short fiction allows me to do, which I enjoy is uh, experiment with form. Um, it's much easier to, to do that in short, and then decide whether or not it's something that is worth experimenting with in long. Um, I've had short fiction that I'm like, this is, uh, this is great and sustainable for, you know, 7,000 words uh, and should never be a novel. <laughs> no one yeah. would want to read that. I would not want to read that. <laughs> and since you'd have to read it 5,000 times before you were done. Oh, yeah. that to yourself. You know, I think that's interesting because uh, you know, I encourage a lot of students that I've worked with and people in the Creative Academy to think about writing short fiction, regardless if you're trying to publish it, as just a way to practice craft. Yeah. Um, and I would give credit, except I have no idea who did it. But I remember hearing about one writer who came up with the goal that they were going to write a short story a week for a year. I know several different writers who have done that um, and, and made that effort. I uh, I was actually doing that for a while um, when I started um, early on. I was participating in a group called Liberty Hall Writers, and they had a weekly flash fiction challenge. So every weekend, uh, you would get a writing prompt, and as soon as you received the writing prompt and and opened it, a timer would go off, and you had an hour and a half from that point to turn in a story. Um, it just gave me hives. <laughs> like I yeah. just felt the breakout under my shirt. Yeah. So it was, what was interesting about it was um, it was a really good structure because the, um, the way it worked was each, you, you'd break into groups and each group had about six to eight people in it. And in that group, um, you could go for best overall story or best use of dialogue, or best use of description, um, best structure. So you could, uh, you know, best opening, best ending. You could, you would get a, a, a little award, you know, which was basically, and the winner of is, you know, that, that was the award. But the thing about it was that it encouraged you to, to really practice craft, to think, okay, you know what? I don't have a good idea for this one this week. So I'm just gonna focus on dialogue because I had trouble with dialogue last week. So this week is just dialogue. And, and it, was, it was really liberating in that way because, because it made it much clearer that these were practice pieces. And then a lot of times we'd come back and, and unpack them into something larger. For instance, uh, Shades of Milk and Honey, which is the first of my glamorous histories novels, 
was a flash fiction exercise for Liberty Hall originally. And, and a big chunk of the first chapter is still that story more or less, I mean, it's edited, but more or less structurally unchanged. Um, That's kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, Evil Robot Monkey, which was the first thing I was nominated for Hugo for, I wrote in an hour and a half. Um, it is, and and really did very little editing after that. And it's, um, it is 957 words that I wrote in an hour and a half. I have other stories that I've written and put in the trunk. And it's like, you know, that was a great exercise. I'm glad I did that. Uh, so it was it was a big range of things um, that came out of those exercises, those, those uh, those exercises. So I do think that there is there is something worthwhile in saying, I'm going to try to write a story a week. I think it is damaging to say, I'm going to write a saleable story a week. And there's a big difference um, between, I'm going to practice my craft every week and I have expectations about what this practice, it's like saying, I'm going to play etudes on the stage of the Carnegie. It's like, but why? <laughs> No one wants to actually hear you play etudes every yeah. now and then. Scales and arpeggios on the stage of the Carnegie. No. I can't even do that. I, I mean, I think the important thing is whether people are doing it once a week or once a month or, or just trying it out is it's a great way to practice craft and to practice the habit of writing. Yeah, exactly. Um, the habit is the part that I think distinguishes people between who might love to write because it's a simply a creative expression and people who have the goal of writing because of the creative expression, but also because they're hoping to sell or to be a working author, then you got to figure out how to get your ass in the seat. And that habit is the key. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody varies on, on how much they can write and, and how long, like I have a friend who I hate more than a little bit right now, who for reasons uh, wrote a novel, an 80,000 word novel in two weeks. Huh? Yeah. No, we hate some a little. Um, I hate them a lot right now. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. But I have other friends who are equally successful, who are you know, it's a novel every ten years. Yeah, and and it's so. I think when you're you're talking about you know career uh, as a writer, that it's it's also important to know like kind of what your goals are, like what why you're writing. Um, and I feel that way about short stories too. It's like if you're writing to learn to practice craft, honestly, they don't have to be stories unless what you're practicing is structure. Um, otherwise, you can just practice vignettes. Like if you don't like short stories as a form, practice writing scenes, you know, practice, just practice description, practice dialogue scenes. Um, but if you like short fiction, or if you're not sure, if you're like, well, I don't know, I, I don't think I like short fiction because I've had trouble at it. Well, you know, I, <laughs> I had trouble playing violin when and I started too. And then later I got better. <laughs> I didn't. I played violin when I was a child, but I never got better. I played for 17 years. Yeah, no. no. I was a quitter. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, but you, you, the, so I was talking to someone the other day and they, they were like, Mary, you're good at everything you do. And I'm like, the key is I'm good at everything I do. I drop the things I'm not good at and, and specifically the things I don't enjoy. You know, um, the reason I played for 17 years and don't still play is that there were other things that I enjoyed more than violin. Yeah. Um, I miss it sometimes, but there were other things that gave me more joy and and that gave me a better way to express myself. So I don't play the violin anymore. I mean, there was also a shoulder injury, but <laughs> whatever details. That's not important. No. So you talked a little bit about some short stories that, you know, kind of grew into something else. And I had actually written down because I knew... Um, your two most recent novels, which again are The Calculating Stars and The Faded Sky, came out of a short story that you did called The Lady Astronaut of Mars. And I remember reading that short story when it came out um, because I was just sort of fascinated by the topic. But how did you grow the you know, Lady Astronaut into a novel? Like, how did that happen? Uh, so what I did um, with these, the Lady Astronaut of Mars takes place toward the end of my main character's life. Um, and the backstory of, of her life is that it's an alternate history in which an asteroid struck the earth in 1952. And 
<laughs> you know, it, it struck Washington, D.C. specifically. Could it Maybe. come now? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, la, la, la. Uh, giant asteroid. I voted for the giant asteroid is actually a postcard that I made. Um, but, uh, but anyway, point being, the... Um, the thing that I decided to do was go back and explore that backstory because it was pretty interesting. And this was actually a trick that I picked up from um, uh, Orson Scott Card, who politics aside is, was a great teacher. Um, and he did this with Ender's Game. The, the Ender's Game began as a short story and he went back and explored everything that led up to that, to, uh, to one of the scenes in the battle school and then looked at the ramifications afterwards. So short fiction is often really exploring a single critical moment in a person's life. Um, and novels are exploring kind of the, the, the structure that surrounds that moment, the, the lead up to it and then the ramifications thereafter. So I, I just decided to do ramific the, the, the lead up. Um, and what I originally did, so it's a novelette, Lady Astronaut of Mars. So my original structure for the novel was to structure it as three novellas to mimic what I was doing in the, uh, in the, the novel, uh, and in the original Lady Astronaut of Mars to mimic that sort of structure. Um, I kept the, the narrative voice, which was first person, but, uh, but she's younger. And, um, and then I, I started working on that and looking at, at three pivotal points in her life. And when I got into, so I wrote the first novella, which is part one of the novel. And then I wrote the second one and there were some scenes that I was having to skip a little bit because I knew that I wanted, that I was gonna hit very much the same emotional beat in the third novella. And I was like, let me hold it for that. And then I started into the third novella and it felt awful. And I realized that, um, that what was happening was that I was writing for a different audience and that there are things, like if I had actually released them as three individual novellas instead of being packaged as a novel, I think that structure actually would have worked fine. But because of the way readers of novels approach their fiction, because they're looking for that immersion, the stuff that I was skipping in novel form was going to make them feel cheated. So what we did was we took the final novella and we split it off and made it its own novel, which is Faded Sky. And then that allowed me to, the room to unpack the second novella uh, to be part two of Calculating Stars. I probably could have written like three books where part one was its own novel, but it it's, it's a little bit easier to compress like that at the beginning of a story um, than, than it is in the, the middle or an end of a story. So, um, so that was, that was a lot of what I was looking at. It's like, what, what pieces can I leave out and what pieces do I, I really, I, I need to explore for the reader. And a lot of it was also, I, I had had this understanding previously um, when I had unpacked another novella into a novel, which we haven't sold yet um, or even shopped actually, now that I think about it. Um, that makes selling hard. It does, you know, whatever. Um, it Pro needs your day. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Number one thing. Uh, actually, that's the number two thing. The number one thing between most people in publication is finishing the thing. Yes. Uh, number two is not submitting. Um, anyway, but what I had discovered in that uh, was uh, that that readers that was a that was also from something that had been uh, Hugo nominated and and scenes that were directly out of the Hugo nominated work in the novel form people were going ah oh, you know why didn't you do this why didn't you do that I don't know understand about this thing like they were reading it differently because they were coming into it with a different set of expectations and what I discovered from that and then and then rediscovered with the lady astronaut novels is that Novel readers expect that if you haven't put something on the page, it's because you have forgotten about it. You haven't thought about it, that it's an oversight and a mistake. Um, whereas short story readers assume that if you do not put it on the page, it is not important to the story and that you have made a deliberate choice to leave it out. And short fiction readers tend to bring more of themselves 
and they're used to applying more of, of themselves to the story to flesh out the world. Um, and it's, it, it, this makes it sound like I'm saying novel readers expect you to hand everything to them. It's not that. It's that, it, it's that they are looking for a different experience. They are looking for that immersion. And when you leave the immersion out, you're, you're cheating them um, because that's not what they signed up for. Um, so, so that was one of the things that I had to make sure that I was doing with the, uh, the Lady Astronaut novels was making sure that I was providing that immersion, um, that I was uh, unpacking stuff. In a short story, my instinct is, can I reuse a location? Um, do I have to go to a new location? Can I reuse a character? How much can I compress it? And, and how few elements can I use? And with novels, it's very much like, okay, I've already used that location. What other interesting place can I go to so I can show them more of the world? Because otherwise in a novel, it begins to feel claustrophobic. And some of that is how long you're spending in the novel. In a short story, you know, you're, the, the subjective reading experience, uh, you can read a short story in an hour. And in a novel, you're, I mean, there are people who can read them in an hour and I don't understand you people, but you're in it, you're in it for hours or days, sometimes weeks, depending on the novel and, and your own rate of reading speed. So, so your relationship to the space that you're in uh, changes as a reader. And it's important to remember and honor that as a writer, I think. So that's, that's, those are the, the things that I was thinking about when I was shifting from one to the other. What do you think people find most challenging about writing a good short story? Like, where is it that people bump? Um, so what I find is that they bump in a couple of different, they, they fail in a couple of different places. Um, one, like the first thing is that a lot of people who are writing short stories are writing them because they feel like they should, um, but they don't read them. So they don't actually understand what they're aiming for. They're not, they're not part of the target audience and it's always harder to write something when you're not part of the target audience. Yes. Um, so, so one thing I, I would say is that the people who are tr struggling should probably put themselves on a short story diet for like, for just to say, you know what, this month, I'm just gonna read short stories. I'm just gonna read anthologies and collections. I'm not gonna read any novels. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm just gonna try to get a hang of this form. And if I don't like this, this, you know, if I pick up an anthology and I don't like these short stories in it or, or this collection, I'm going to shift to a different one um, because it's potentially that I don't like the, that editor's taste or I don't like the, that short story writer. Um, so, so just reading until you're like, oh, this, this I like these, uh, which is uh, best of the year anthologies are often very good for yeah. this because they give you a nice sampler. Um, so that's one thing is just not understanding what it what that audience experience is like. But structurally, what I see are um, two kind of basic things. One is um, too many characters and locations. One is a, an inability to handle the length. Uh, they have too many characters and locations, and um, and so they get story bloat. Um, that they, they introduce, you know, so it's a mom and she has three kids. I'm like, okay, why does she need three kids? Well, because I'm like, no, no, no. Why does she, what structurally, I understand that each child is different, but what structurally are they doing for your POV character? Um, and so, so too many characters and locations is one thing. Another thing that I will see is, um, is the number of narrative threads that run through it. So frequently there are too many narrative threads, uh, at, which is related to the too many characters and locations. You're just used to being able to put it all in. Uh, the other thing, and this is, I think the one that, this was the one that I struggled with most, um, is that uh, your structure, uh, structure problems show much more in a short story than they do in a novel. So in a novel, you know, you can start and you can end in kind of two different places and people sometimes sort of forget where they started. The middle is a little bit, is a little bit more amorphous because you've got a lot more things going on. In a short story, you really probably only have two major narrative threads going on. So where you start and where you end become really important. And the thing that I would do all the time, and I see this constantly when I'm reviewing student work is stories that have a really great beginning and a really great middle and a really great ending to three completely different stories that happen to have the same set of characters in the same location. 
And so understanding, uh, understanding your opening, that, you're, that you need to open and close the same story um, and that the conflicts in the middle need to be related to that opening and closing. Um, and that you can't bring in all of the extra conflicts that you want to, you have to pick and choose which ones you, you bring in into the middle. Um, that's one of the big, big things. Um, and then I would also say the, the other related to that, um, a lot of times because people approach a short story as they would approach a scene, they'll end it and they'll leave all of these threads open. And it, it just, it's like, but you just stopped. And that's when you, you get the, this feels like the beginning to a novel um, because it is. Yeah. Because <laughs> you haven't actually, yeah. yeah. It's like, you haven't actually ended it. That's yeah. why it feels like it's the beginning of a novel. Fair enough. Now, people of course are interested in selling their work if they can, or at least getting it published, uh, even if there's not necessarily financial reward from that. Where do people find markets for short stories? So um, there are, now bear in mind, I am a science fiction and fantasy writer. So from my perspective, there are more options for selling short stories than there have ever been. Um, other genres have different relationships to short fiction. Um, mimetic fiction, uh, uh, the, the kind of natural literary fiction. Um, there are markets, but they are not always paying markets. And in sh science fiction and fantasy, uh, they are. So if you're having trouble and you're like, I really want to sell my story, just throw a dragon in that sucker and bring it over to my side. Um, <laughs> when in doubt, put in a dragon. That is yeah. today's writing advice. <laughs> today's writing advice, yes. Um, don't don't actually. Well, I mean, actually, I would read more things if if you can. <laughs> if that if that makes narrative sense, put that dragon in there. Um, but uh, but there are a couple of resources that are uh, while they are were started largely by people who are in the science and fiction world. They um, they certainly have other resources, uh, and those are Duotrope.com and uh, the Submission Grinder. Um, and these are databases of uh, short fiction markets. And you can sort it based on the type of fiction you're writing, the pay rate, um, the size of the audience, uh, so circulation, the response time. They're, they're very, very useful for deciding. I'm going to sneeze. I... Oh, the tension. Like... <laughs> oh, I have there a ridiculously long wind up steering, which I cannot speak. It maddens me. Um, so anyway, so they, they, you can sort it, uh, based on what's important to you, uh, their acceptance rate, um, their, you know, response time, all of those things. What I always suggest is that you go in, you, you sort the database and then you start at the top and you work your way down. Now here's where, um, here's where it gets tricky. When you ask an established writer, what markets should I submit to? Their relationship to markets is completely different from an early career writer. It's not that I can submit the phone book and have it accepted. It's that I can submit a story. I, I have a better relationship with the, the editors. Um, and it's not even necessarily that I am writing at a higher level uh, because frequently there are debut writers that, uh, that we just, you know, that, that knock it out of the park on the first time by accident, maybe they, they'll have trouble replicating. And sometimes it's just like they've, they've got a graf grasp on their craft, but when I submit something, the editor knows that I'm gonna be able to take editorial feedback. And that's, that's why sometimes I can place things at a market uh, now, and I wouldn't necessarily be able to place the same story if I were writing under a pseudonym. Um, so, and that sounds like it's politics and to a certain degree it is, but it's also about the editor the editor needs to know that that the editorial process of fixing something that has a hole in it is not going to be a painful one. Um, so, so, so I can't say you should send it to these markets. Uh, what I can say is uh, that there are there's a metric by which you can measure markets. As you're moving through your career, you're going to need to focus on one of three things: uh, size of audience, pay rate, and shininess. So size of audience is pretty clear. How, how many people does this market reach? Pay rate is pretty clear. How much money does this market pay? 
And the shiny is the part of that's a little bit more ephemeral. And it's it's how much do you want to do you personally want to be in this particular market? So like the magazine of fantasy and science fiction no longer is one of the top paying markets in the field, but it's a magazine that I grew up reading. And it's one that I, I want to be in. It doesn't have the biggest circulation anymore, but it's still one that that has a prestige for me. Shimmer magazine um, has, they're closing, um, so you can't submit to them anymore. But uh, beautiful, beautiful covers. I loved the editorial choices. They had a circulation of about 500 people um, and paid uh, market minimums. So, but I loved the magazine. And so, so shiny was, you know, that was a shininess that was appealing to me. There are other points in my career where I was, uh, we were living in Manhattan and I was supporting us, my husband and myself, who was unemployed at the time, I was supporting us on my theater and writing income. Oh, good choice. Yeah. Oh yeah. It was great. <laughs> it, was, it was good. It was a good life there. Um, so the, the money, the money metric, it was like, I don't care how ugly your cover is. How much do you pay me? Yeah. Um, so you, you're the only one who can decide which thing is more important to you. Right now, where I am in my career with short fiction, um, I am primarily concerned with audience because it drives people towards my novels and novels are where I make most of the money these days. Um, and and so it's it, it varies, um, but I will still, like I'm writing a story, I'm writing a story for Shimmer's last issue. Um, uh -huh. It's madness. Um, but I'm doing that, you know, it's, there is, uh, there are more financially rewarding ways to recoup that. Uh, but, um, but I, the shiny, the shiny aspect of it is, is huge right now. So I'm, uh, so it varies. So you can use that when you're, when you're ranking them, it's like, you know, oh, oh, I want to be in that magazine. There. Now I'm gonna tell people that if they enjoyed your pithy advice today, they should definitely check out Writing Excuses, which is a podcast 15 minutes long uh, because- You're in a hurry and we're not that smart. I love that start. So <laughs> definitely check that out. If you have an opportunity to see Mary at any conference, I would highly recommend. I've been to Mary's sessions and enjoyed them. Occasionally you do do a short story workshop. Are you still doing those? Yes. Uh, my short story intensives. Um, I think my next one is. I think my next one is sold out. Um, the best way to get on them, uh, to find out when I'm doing them, um, I advertise them to my uh, newsletter first. Perfect. So sign up for my newsletter, and um, I only take eight people at a time, so they tend to sell out fairly quickly. Uh, and I also um, uh, my Patreon and my Drip accounts. Uh, I teach classes through those. So where can people sign up for your newsletter? MaryRobinetteKowal.com. Perfect. <laughs> but nicely it's, done. I like the you. at the end. That was Ding! good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the sidebar uh, has has the sign up form for the uh, the newsletter. And, and I also look for beta readers sometimes too. Ooh, and I can tell you having had a sneak peek before, it's kind of fun to get in on those. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much, Mary, for coming to the Creative Academy. I want to thank everyone for listening to this uh, small little episode on short stories. And if you have any questions, I do still hold weekly office hours. So I hope to see you there and I'll do my best to answer those questions. So thank you, everyone. Are you a member yet? Join us today and unlock a wealth of resources, masterclasses, feedback opportunities, and community events designed to help you reach the next step in your writing journey. No matter what stage you're at, we've got a helping hand to guide you along the way. Check out our free resource room if you'd like to get a taste of how we can help you reach your writing and publishing goals. Thanks for bringing us along on your writing and publishing journey. Donna, Crystal, and I hope we'll see you around the Creative Academy soon.